While you guys are turning to this first Peter chapter two, I'll remind you that in your bulletin there is this little sheet of paper that will help you kind of follow along, but also there's a lot of scriptures that we're not going to get to this morning. But I would encourage you to take this home with you and to look them up and, and uh, read them, study them, see what God says to you through them throughout the week, even this afternoon, because um, there's a lot more to this than what we're going to get to this morning. What is on your mind right now? As, P, as, a, as Billy just read, as he just sang, and we're going to read, God's mind definitely has been on you. <laughs> it has been on you from the, before your conception, before you were ever born, before your parents ever thought of you. What is your mind on today? What are you thinking about right now? I pray that we are focused on why we're here, that we're focused on his word. So... I want you to notice two points from this morning as we're going to be studying for, through 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Just two verses, but I want you to think of two main points throughout this. The first one being that you are only a traveler through this world. You're a sojourner. You're a pilgrim. I want you to really think about what that means to us today as a pilgrim, as a sojourner. And secondly, I want you to see that Peter is calling us, is commanding us to abstain from some things, to stay pure to stay free from sin, to stay away from evil that we are constantly surrounded by, all right? Two basic things in these two verses that we're going to talk about. Would you read with me the first Peter, chapter 2, verses 11 and 12? Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as an evildoer, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Would you pray with me? Father, we've opened your word. Now we rely upon you to speak it to us. Father, we love your word. We love the fact that you've given it to us, that through the ages of history, uh, men and women have literally died for this, to keep it pure, to keep it in our hands. Father, I pray that we, uh, that we absorb it this morning, that your Holy Spirit speaks specifically and directly to each one of us to allow us to hear exactly what you would have us to get from these two verses. Lord, speak. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So in the, just the first few verses that we spoke of last Sunday and that we've been going through in this first chapter of Peter, I want you to remember that he's talking to fellow Christians those chosen generation, right? To us, the church. He's speaking literally to us. That holy priesthood, a people that no longer walk in darkness as we spoke of last week, right? Bumping off of things, bouncing off of things as anybody that's ever walked in total darkness can experience. We are not those people. And this church that he's preaching to, that he's writing this letter to, is not that people. So we get to this point where we find out at the very first of chapter, the very first of 11 here, that we see Peter with some great compassion. He has this, this compassion in his voice that you can hear, a love and a conviction that this apostle of God, the leader of this church, says, beloved, I beg you. Now you see, he's an apostle, which means he has authority. He has authority to command them as followers of Christ what to do, but he doesn't use that authority. He says, I beg you you believers. He says, I beg you to come. I beseech you, please, is what Peter is saying. Not authoritative father figure, do what I'm telling you. It's a gentle, compassionate calling that Peter's doing. Peter writes and reminds them that they are only temporary travelers here on this earth. These Christ followers, their true citizenship, and if you, if you're a Christ follower, your true citizenship isn't here. This earth, these few short years, 80, 90, even 100, you're just traveling. This is not your true country. This is not where you belong. Verse 11, he says, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain, abstain from the fleshly lust that war against your soul. Really think about that verse. Just allow it to penetrate into your brain what this verse means to our belief and to our walk with Christ. He lovingly reminds them that their citizenship is not here, telling them that they're not from around here, that they have temporary residency. We know a little bit about that in Russia. We were just passing through. That wasn't our country. 
That wasn't our language. It wasn't our culture. We cannot get comfortable here on this earth. We can't be comfortable. We can't be accustomed to these cultures that we are surrounded about. We can't conform to this culture. This American Christianity, even, is what I'm talking about. But I'm speaking about these 80, 90 years you have here. We have to be ready. As pilgrims and sojourners, as foreigners in this world, we can expect to not fit in. As a matter of fact, if you fit in, I can almost guarantee you, you are not walking the Lord's way. You are not following the scripture. If you fit in so well that no one even notices that you're different, that's a problem. It should be a problem in your mind. You cannot expect to fit in here. We always look, sound, act different because we live different. We even smell a little different. You know, when you're in another world, uh, Brother Malcolm was talking about that this morning. When you hear English, when you're in another country, you hear English, it just piques your, your interest. You know that person's language. You know their culture. You know who they are, and it draws you to them. The very same thing happens in spiritually. When you meet a brother or sister in Christ in another country, you just feel it. There's this odor. There's this error about them. You know, without talking to them, you know they're a believer in Christ. And it happens here in America, too, the same thing. We have this, this sense about us. We must have that. See, while we lived in, in, uh, in Russia, we were outsiders. The Rogersons were outsiders the entire time. Every day we were there. We didn't have to speak. I wouldn't even have to say a word, and they knew just by looking at me, by the way I stood, by the way I didn't stand, by the smile or absence of smile, whatever it was on my face, by my clothes, by everything about my appearance, by the things I did and didn't do, they knew I was a, I was a foreigner. Maybe not where I was from, but they knew I was a foreigner. Does the world see us this way? Does the world look in on your life and say, they're not from around here. There's something different about that person. See, in these next few verses, Peter says that we are not only to look and to sound and to act different, but that this world is going to be hostile towards us. Hostile. They're not going to appreciate our differences. I can guarantee you that if you live that life, you will not be appreciated for the life you live. He says, he goes on to say, in this world, this secular world that doesn't nor can it understand your ways, it can't understand it because it doesn't understand the Father, the King, the Savior you serve. And if they can't understand him, they can't understand you because you are to be like him. They never see his splendor. They never taste his mercies. They never see his grace, right? It reminds me of a, of a story I heard of an old man who went to a lecture at a, on, a, on a university campus. There was going to be an atheist, a famous atheist, come in. And he starts his lecture. For two hours, he expounds on how God cannot be real, on how it cannot be possible. Scientifically, God does not exist. And through two hours of, of listening, this older man sat in the back of the auditorium. It was full. And at the end, the professor said, any questions? And this older gentleman stood up, and he had a, an apple, and he was eating his apple. And he said, yes, sir. The old man said to the professor, I have one question. Chomp, chomp, chomp. He ate his apple. He said, uh, you've given us a lecture for two hours. You've told us why God cannot exist. Chomp, 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 eating his apple. He said, uh, I have one question for you, sir. Chomp, chomp, eating his apple. Took his little bag, threw his core in there, wrapped it up, set it down to the side. The professor is getting annoyed that this person has taken so much time to ask this question. What's your question, old man? And he says, was the apple I just ate sweet? And the professor says, how in the world could I know if your apple was sweet? I didn't taste it. And the old man says, exactly. You've never tasted of my spirit. You've never tasted of my Savior. How could you know if he exists? See, in our world today, they don't know the Lord you know. They can't possibly understand it. You're going to look different. You're going to feel different. You're going to be accused of certain things. The world's going to be hostile towards you in some ways if you live this life. See, our differences confuse them. They confuse them. They cause them to distrust us. In Russia, for the first probably five or six years, Jeff could attest to this and Krisha, if I didn't do shots with them, if I didn't drink vodka, they didn't trust me. They couldn't trust me because I had something I was hiding because I wouldn't allow the vodka to loosen up my lips. So I was hiding something from them. They wouldn't trust me because I was different. They disliked me because I was different. Even 
hated sometimes because of where I was from. This is a perfect illustration of the way we live in this world today. Why? Because we are different. Because we won't join them in their foreign culture and customs. We can't get involved in those things. See, just a little bit later, we're going to get to this, but in chapter 4 of verse Peter, it says this. Listen as I read this. For we have spent enough years in our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, the world. When we walked in lewdness, in lusts, in drunkenness, in rivalries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries, in regard to these things, they think it strange that we don't run with them into the same flood of dispensation, speaking evil of us. See, the world doesn't understand why you say no to certain things and yes to other. They don't understand why you're sitting here this morning on a beautiful morning when the lake is calling, when there's so many other things we could be doing. They just don't get it. It doesn't make sense to them. But see, Paul says, right, Peter says right here, you have spent enough time in that world. Look to the future world. Look to the, your, your actual world where God is calling you. Peter says here is that um, they just can't understand you. They're going to speak evil of you because you're a stranger, because you're a foreigner. But in verse 11, back in our verses here in chapter 2, it says, abstain from fleshly lust, which war. That's a graphic word, which war against the soul. Peter, through the inspiration, by the way, this is the inspired word of God. Peter, through the inspired word of God, says abstain. Now, this word abstain, we hear it a lot, right? We, we used to hear it more. It's holding oneself away from fleshly lusts so that you have a greater impact on your foreign culture. Holding yourself away. That, that view is self-control. That's what that looks like, self-control. And it's something uh, our culture has pretty much forgotten, right? As a matter of fact, we... Uh, we celebrate the lack of self-control in our culture today, in this American culture today. We celebrate it. We embrace it. We say, be different in a, not a way that the scripture's talking about. Release your inhibitions. Be who God, or be who you want to be. Peter says the, that these fleshly lusts war against our soul. Now, I've never been in war. I've never been in battle. I don't know what uh, those men who have what picture they could paint us. But uh, I imagine it's very violent, right? It's a very graphic. It has certain smells. It has certain sounds, certain visual images you never lose. This is the illustration Peter uses. He says, these fleshly lusts war against your soul. The lust is anything, by the way, the definition, anything that draws you away from a perfect, centered relationship with our Lord. That's what you can put in there is lust. That's what is causing us to be drawn away. We are called to be pilgrims on this earth for these years we have who practice self-control by abstaining, pushing away from fleshly lust. I can sum it up. Like I could give you a list of what Christians should and shouldn't do. We could be really legalistic. I could write it up here on the wall. We would agree or we would disagree. You guys could scratch out a few, add a few in, right? We can do that as Christians. But I can sum it all up in one verse to make it a lot easier for us. 1 Thessalonians 5.22. Abstain from every form of evil. <laughs> every form. Even the appearance of evil is what that means. Abstain from it. Stay away from it. If it has the appearance of evil, don't do it. Peter is saying here that this is a war, a spiritual war, and it's not going to be easy. War within ourselves war against our own flesh. This is like a civil war, and there's nothing civil about it. It's going to be painful to fight against my own flesh. War within ourselves, war against our flesh. Peter says that this flesh lusts against our soul. Not easily done day in and day out. This is not a simple task. I'm not telling you that it's going to be simple. As a matter of fact, if anybody stands at a pulpit like this and says, come to Christ, it's, it'll, it'll make your life easier. They're not telling you the truth. Your life won't get easier. This promises you it will only get more difficult. This is a battle, internal battle, that you're going to have to battle. You're going to have to fight. He wouldn't tell you to abstain, by the way, if it wasn't possible, right? 
A preacher, an apostle, is not going to give you information and say, by the way, it's impossible to do that. Peter is giving us something that we actually can do. This fight has two fronts. I want you to notice these two fronts. We're going to spend more time on the internal, but there's also an external. This fight with our soul has two fronts that you're going to battle, an internal and an external. This is, this is the main point, by the way, so please hear this. Internally, we war against our own fleshly lust. It's a flesh it's our earthly bodies. It's what we want. It's the weaknesses and evil desires that our flesh, this body, craves. There's another word for you. It craves it. It desires it. I wake up in the morning with this. I go to bed with this same craving, this same desire, like water, like food. You want it so bad. It's that lust of the flesh. Internal war. Fact. Here's a fact for you. Maybe you've never heard this before, but I want you to hear it today. The flesh and body will never be saved. Did you hear that? Your flesh, this thing that wraps around your soul and spirit, will never get saved. It will always struggle and fight and pull you towards the cravings of sinful flesh. You will not save it. It was never promised to be saved. Scripture never says that Jesus is going to save your, your, your physical flesh he says it's going to die. Only your soul can be saved. Only your soul is eternal. It has eternal worth. It has eternal worth in heaven, in the presence of God, in his grace and mercy, or it has eternity in hell, in the presence of God and his eternal wrath. Do you see that? Your soul is eternal. Your flesh is but for a moment. And it will never relinquish its desire for sin and for lust. Do you see the importance in this point? Do you hear me? Please, do you hear me? I'm telling you that your earthly flesh and blood will always struggle, will always strive for sin, for lust. But you're saying, preacher, what about that new creation verse in the scripture? What about that old things are passed away and behold, all things are new? I'm glad you asked that, right? Because in fact, you were born. You were conceived into sin, your fleshly body, this body and soul. You were conceived into sin. You never knew a moment of life without sin. You have always been covered in the shame and dirtiness of sin. I need you to really feel that for a moment. I think we skip over this too quickly. Often, we just let that go right on by ourselves. We have always known sin. We've always known guilt, so we don't feel it. It's that same idea of, does a fish know that it's wet? Of course not. It's always been in the water. Not until you pull it out, and then it feels something, right? We don't know what it's like to be without sin. You've always experienced it. At birth, your sin separated you from God. Your sin separated you from God and put you in desperate need of a Savior. It was your nature to sin. Your nature was sin. The key here, the difference for a Christ follower, this is where that old things become, all things become new, the new creation. Here's the difference. A Christ follower, a person that accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, now has a new struggle. See, when I was lost, I didn't struggle with sin. <laughs> I loved it. I enjoyed it. I would look for other ways to be involved in it. I would look for other people to be involved in it with me. But when all things became new, my flesh didn't change, but my soul did. My spirit now desired something different. There was a struggle, a fight within me. No more of an internal peace that I had over this sin that I enjoyed, that I kept all around me. Now there's a war within my spirit, my soul. This new creation, a blood-bought Christ follower is going to feel this. They're going to feel guilt and shame. And you know what it's going to do? It's going to drive them to live a spirit-filled life. That guilt and that shame... The law written on their heart is going to drive them to know Christ as their Savior. Not just to be good. It's not just for moralism. It's not just to live a good life, to check off the right boxes, to be at the right places. It's not moralism. It's not good for goodness sake. It has nothing to do with that, but it does have everything to do with you strive differently now because your soul has been changed. There's a fact. The lost world does not feel the same about guilt and sin. 
Did you know that? The lost world does not. That's why when you look and you read the news and you look outside these walls, the world just seems so chaotic. All the things that they're involved in, all of the, 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 the lust that they're enjoying, to us seems so strange. But to them, it's so natural. They don't understand and feel the shame. Now, they do dislike getting caught, right? They don't like being caught. When they get caught, they say, I'm sorry, just like we teach our kids to do. <laughs> Tell your brother you're sorry for slapping him in the face. Well, he's not sorry, but you're going to make him do it anyway. Same in our world. Say you're sorry for murder, for stealing, for lying, for cheating, for speeding, whatever the sin might be. And they, they got caught, so they have to say, I'm sorry. But see, they don't feel shame over those secret sins that they've got hidden that no one else knows about. But see, a follower of Christ, what Peter's saying, those who know Christ as their Savior, those secret sins drive them to the cross. They can't sleep at night feeling the conviction. It's a war. A Christian will sin. A Christian will fall, slide, trip over their flesh. That will happen. I'm a great testimony to that. The difference is that they will not stay there. They can't stay there. They feel an inward kicking, punching, prodding. It doesn't allow them to stay involved in that sin. They aren't sad for getting caught. They're not putting on a show because they got busted. It's an internal feeling of brokenness. Heart brokenness. They don't, uh, they don't and they won't run towards sin. They don't, this is a scripture, they don't drink it down as the rest of the world does, and wallow in it. That's a, that's a pig term, right? To wallow in their sin. That's what our world does. A Christian cannot do it. See, there's a difference of fighting, this internal life and death struggle over good and evil that is real within ourselves. Do you have that? Have you ever experienced that? See, I meet a lot of people on the street that say, Courts, I'm a Christian, but I'm not really sure about salvation. They say, well, have you ever this? Have you ever this? And they have some answers that they get right, and some that they don't know the answers to. Here's the definition. Do you feel shame over the sin that no one else knows about? And I mean soul-breaking pain, a war within. If you don't, there's concern. There should be concern. This is what the important thing is. A true Christ follower... There is no longer a category of secular and spiritual. For a true Christ follower, there is no categorizing those things. I don't have my, my secular life and my spiritual life. Everything is spiritual. Everything is spiritual if you are a true Christ follower. As Peter is trying to tell us right here, there aren't categories. You've got new ownership. You have been bought with a price. You are now slaves to Christ. Instead of slaves to sin, you don't have to allow this sin to rule and reign over your life, but it will be a struggle. It will be a fight. It will be a war within. All right, the second point, I tell you there's an internal struggle and an external struggle. This one's much shorter, but here's the external struggle. It's a fight with our culture. We're going to fight with our culture. Now, today it's kind of dangerous to say those words because if something happens outside these walls, then they point back and say, oh, those Christians are all about anger and fighting and kicking and hitting and shooting and all this stuff. That's not what it's talking about. We have to fight with our culture. We have to kick and push against all these little temptations and tasty treats that they continue to put before our flesh because our flesh desires those things. We have to push back at that with self-control. As a Christ follower, this external war with the world says, I will not be forced to take part with you in this sin. I won't be coerced. I won't be beat down into a corner. 
I will stand up for what I believe. I'll stand up for my convictions, and I will not allow this lost world to master me or to make me slave to their lustly patterns and their sinful desires. It says, I am dead to sin. Now, last I checked, when things are dead, you don't pick them up and carry them around with you, right? Who's ever had a puppy die? You bury that thing and you leave it in the ground. You don't go pick it back up, dig it back up, and play with it. You're dead to sin. Bury it, leave it, walk around. Both of these battles, both your internal and external, are going to be one in the same place. You're going to win them in the same place. That place is in your mind. This is not a Dr. Phil moment. I'm just telling you that you are going to win this battle in your mind. It's an inner place that must be changed by God, that must be governed by his holy scripture. But it's going to happen right here in your mind. See, lusts and these desires, these cravings, these longings, the worldly sexual things that are so tasty and we are drawn to them, that are forbidden by scripture, they first are conceived in your mind. They're first allowed to take root in your mind. See, you're drawn away from a Christ-like life. You're drawn away from Scripture towards lust. And as you're drawn away and tempted, you have a moment to say, I will not. I will not allow my mind to continue to think about this thought that's going to draw me into a, a place that is not best. It's a mental longing, longing and allowing for sin in your mind that starts the body and soul and spirit down a path to death and destruction. Your mind takes you there. It allows you to have these thoughts, these ideas that then end up on a slippery slope towards death and destruction. It most often begins in a secret place of your mind. That's why scripture says to renew your mind on that little ver- on this little sheet. There's a, there's, a, there's a verse in, Ro- there's a chapter, Romans 12 verses 2 and 1 and 2 that says this. Listen, please. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Your reasonable service. Verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There it is. By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that which is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. It happens in your mind, a renewing of it. If you give up the battlefield of your mind, your heart's next. It starts in your mind, and it works into your heart. This temptation, this lust, it pushes down roots into your heart, and then the battle becomes much more difficult. Then it's a habit that you've formed. James 1, 13 and 15 says this, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But, verse 14 says, but each one, you and I, each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires, by his lust and enticed. Then when his desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings death. Each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Drawn away. This is a visual image of a a beast, a cow, a bull, with a ring in its nose, just being taken wherever you want it to go. It can't control if it wants to go right or left. It's being drawn by whoever's in control of that rope. It has that view of that if you are being drawn by your own desires, being led around. James goes a little further. He goes on to say in verse 15, when desire has conceived, this is a a scientific idea here, a birth of a baby even thought, but it's dealing with sin. When desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. What a powerful illustration that James gives us. When desire, lust, and passion has been conceived in the mind thought out, fully developed, really poured over. Lust then gives birth to sin. Sin, as it is full grown, becomes an adult, brings forth death. It's a full circle. It's a natural progression that if you start in the mind, it will 100% allow yourself to come right back around. Full circle to death. Conception, 
birth, full-grown death, a sin circle. Remember, Peter says to abstain from fleshly lust, from the mental con conception of sin, from the mental conception of sin, leave it alone from the, from the very beginning, cast it aside, from ever giving an inch of mental ground for the seed to begin to grow in your heart. Don't even give it an inch. Don't give it a second. Many people want to, want to do this. They want to say, courts, I can look, but I won't touch. You ever heard that? Heard that thousands of times. I can look, but I won't touch. It won't affect me if I just allow my mind to contemplate on it. Why do you think pornography is such a terrible, terrible pandemic right now on the internet for everyone, not just men, for women too? Because they think they can look, but not touch. They haven't committed adultery. They haven't done anything sinful. It's not possible, and I want to prove to you why. See, lust is a mental beginning. It starts there. They think that they can head that direction and then slam on the brakes and everything's going to be fine, that their conscience won't be convicted because they haven't done anything physical, that it's just a mental. Nobody's getting hurt, right? This is a mental thing within my own head. I'm not hurting anyone. You do not live in the real world if you believe that. I want to give you two verses. There's many, many more. Two verses that prove that sin begins much quicker than that for the believer much sooner than the physical act. Here it is, Matthew 5, 27 and 28 says, you have heard it said of those of old, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, this is red letter, by the way, this is Jesus speaking, verse 28, but I say to you, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He's saying that the sin began in the mind and because they dwelled upon it, it was already sin. Do you see that? It's not just a physical act of committing adultery. It's not just the physical act of hating your brother because it goes on to talk about that. If you hate without cause, you're a murderer. You've already killed him. You would do it in your mind. So it is sin in God's eyes. Sin begins in your mind, people. Verse 15, Matthew chapter 15, 19 says this. Jesus is speaking again. And he says, do you not yet understand that whatsoever enters the mouth goes to the stomach and is eliminated. But those things which proceed out of the mouth comes from the heart, and they defile a man. What comes from the heart can defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. These are some of the thoughts. This is the list. Evil thoughts, murders, adultery, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Those things begin in your heart, which is related to in scripture to your head. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands, that doesn't defile a man. It's what comes out of his heart, what comes out of his mouth. Don't fall for the false narrative is what I'm trying to tell us, church. That says that Christians can think, watch, see, and do things and it won't affect their Christian life. <laughs> Don't fall for it. That is childish and it is dangerous to believe that you can look but not touch. Every sin was first conceived in the mind. Allow time and space to root in your heart, it will take over your life. It will destroy your life. We are at war, or we are supposed to be at war, church. We are supposed to be at war against this world that we live in for these few short years. If you are a blood-bought follower of Christ, know that this war is not for your soul, because if you're a blood-bought uh, follower of Christ, you are, your soul's already been purchased. But the war is over your soul, not for it. It's been purchased. It can't be sold and bought on the market. But it is, a, it is no doubt a, a, a battle for your soul. It only says here that um, the flesh lusts and wars with it. This internal and external struggle must be won on the front lines of our mind. There's our front lines. There's where the war takes place on our minds. What do you feed your mind with? These are some questions for you. What do you feed your mind with? What are you putting in? If you're putting in everything that your lost friends are putting in, what do you expect to come out? What are you feeding your mind with? If it's scripture, there's going to be a different outcome. Something else is going to come out of it. What of the world do you allow to enter into your mind? What do you allow it to tempt you with? Daily, weekly, at night. Russians, never turn their TV off. It is on 24 hours a day. It doesn't matter. They don't even know what's going on in that, in that room, in that TV. And there's a TV in every room, right? <laughs> what, are you, 
What do we allow in our own homes to watch, to listen to, to read? Finally, I want to read you Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Spend your time thinking about these very things. Why is the question. Why do it? Well, first of all, the Lord deserves your mind to be pure and to be transformed daily because you cannot live a Christian life without your mind being right first. You can't fake this with people very long. You can fake it for a little while, but you will be found out. You need to struggle to fight this, this battle with your flesh and your mind. The first reason is because God deserves it. Second reason is what we find in this second verse, verse 12, because we have an influence over the lost world. We should have an influence over the lost world. Verse 12 of 2 Peter says this, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak evil against you, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God on the day of judgment. The second reason is so that you can be honorable among the Gentiles, the lost world, so that when they look at you, they will, by the way, speak evil of you. They will try to find something false and wrong in your life because they just can't imagine that you would be different than them. But when they try to do that, when they dig in to your personal life, when they look at your uh, history on your computer, they don't find the same things they find on theirs. There's nothing there. They, they find out that you're honorable and excellent. See, see, the world, as we're closing, the world wants to find wrong with us. And they will argue, just like that professor wanted to argue with that old man. They will argue about facts. They can find statistics to prove their own point. They have their own ideas about how the world began, about what's important to life. But you know what they can't argue with? A holy life. A holy life set apart to God. They just can't argue with that. There's nothing they can say against it. That's what Peter is asking us to do here. We need to live honorably so that the world will watch and see us. So what does the Christian walk look like? In your mind, think about that. What does the Christian walk look like? What does your Christian walk look like? What do you war with internally? Do you struggle over your secret sin? What do you war with externally, Christian? What do you battle over? Maybe today you don't profess to be a Christian. You're lost. Maybe this is the first time you've ever heard any of this information about God and about what he requires about sin and justice and hell and heaven and eternal punishment. Maybe it's the first time you've ever thought about that. Well, I would ask you to, to finish that thought out, to find the answers. The answers, I would love to speak with you at any moment, so would many of the people in this church, to explain that further to you. Because God demands holiness, people. His word says it. I demand holiness, not just goodness, not moralism, but holiness from us. And that can only be done through a life spent of sanctification, this process that we have to go through. Unsaved, will you see your condition today? Those who do not know Christ, will you see your condition clearly before God? Really look. Think about it. You're a fish. You're wet. Really think about sin in your own life and how you have to stand before God one day. Do you see that sin? Does it cause you to question the future, what it holds when you stand before God? If you die today, do you know the condition of your heart? Do you know what happens? Do you know the Bible speaks so much more about hell than it does heaven? There is so much more information about hell. Come today. That's what I would tell you. Come today. Cry out to God. Say, God, be merciful. I mean, cry out for his grace. can save you but it won't be a secret he won't save in secret he says I'll save you I'll buy you I'll purchase your blood but it means you are purchased by him he's your Lord he can't just be a secret savior will you pray with me father we uh, your word is so so rich there's so much there. 
Father, I pray that you make it simple for us, for me. Father, help me to see the deep truths simply as a child so that I can adjust and fight and struggle with this flesh and win, Lord, daily, minute by minute, victories. Father, help me to see that people are watching. The world is watching. My neighbors are watching what this Christian does. Father, make that invaluable to me so that I can bring you glory, Father, through my life, through my words, through my comings and goings. But Father, more importantly, because you deserve it. Lord, help me to live a Christ-like life because you deserve it. Father, for all of us that are in here this morning, I pray that you are speaking to us, that you're speaking to every soul that is sitting in these, these chairs. Father, that they are listening. Father, that you're convicting of secret sin, that you're convicting of areas that we have not yet given to you. Father, take them. Reach down and take them. Show them. Show us where we fall short of you, Father, and convict us. Lord, it's in your Son's powerful name we pray and wait and ask and beg for your grace and mercy. In your Son's name I pray. Amen.